Welcome to the workshop, CAR T-cell therapy for lymphoma, the good, the bad, and the exciting. My name is Michelle Kostick, and I will be your moderator for this workshop. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Kite, a Gilead company whose support helped make this workshop possible. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Michael Tease. Dr. Tease is an associate member at the Colorado Blood Cancer Institute and a leader in their lymphoma and autoimmune program. He focuses on the treatment and management of aggressive lymphocytic disorders and malignancies. Dr. Tease treats patients with a standard approach CAR T cell therapy, as well as CAR-based therapies in clinical trials. He favors the next phase of lymphoma care being rooted in an individualized and targeted approach and is excited about the rapid pace of development in the field. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tease. Well, thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. Uh, so let's get started. So uh, the learning objectives today are to understand the rationale for using CAR T-cell therapy and lymphoma, know the steps involved in undergoing CAR T-cell therapy, know the short-term side effects and toxicities of CAR T-cell therapy, know the impact on your quality of life, and understand the longer-term side effects and outcomes of CAR T. So. If you're one of my patients, you've definitely seen this before. I think I draw this out for every single new patient that I have because it really starts the conversation on what we do and why. Uh, but everything in the blood and the immune system starts with the stem cell. And the stem cell uh, makes uh, is uh, self-replicating over and over and over again, and it contains the blueprints for everything in the blood and the immune system. And based upon signals from the body, it turns to either myeloid cells or lymphoid cells. And on the myeloid side, uh, there are three cells, and some of you may recognize all three of them, uh, platelets, which form blood clots, red blood cells that carries hemoglobin, and hemoglobin carries oxygen to your body, and then neutrophils. And neutrophils are very important white blood cells that primarily fight bacterial and some fungal infections. And on the lymphoid side, uh, there are two major important cells, T cells and B cells. B cells I describe as like the front lines of your, uh, T cells, excuse me, I describe as the front lines of your military. And uh, they fight the bad folks by recognizing what looks like you and doesn't look like you. So if it looks like you, it's a friend. If it doesn't look like you, it's an enemy and it destroys it. And um, I always say that they're not the brightest bulbs in the bunch, so they need the B cells to tell them what to do. And the B cells have the memory, the strategy, the understanding to know that what you've been exposed to in the past um, is either good or bad, and it can tell the T cells, oh, I know what this is, and, and take care of it. Um, it's how vaccinations work. It's educating B cells. Um, and then there's, this, there's a small population of lymphocytic cells called NK cells, or natural killer cells. And the reason that I uh, am now discussing this is because it has some relevance, as it is a form of, of treatment. Um, there are CAR NK cell uh, therapies that are under investigation, especially at CBCI and and other institutions across the country and world. Um, and there's a remnant of an archaic immune system uh, that has some uh, understanding of how to um, destroy tumors. <clears throat> so uh, before we talk about CAR T cell therapy, I want to just set the stage uh, because some of you may be familiar with other types of therapies. Uh, and it's good to understand what was, what was the case and, and kind of where we are now. Uh, but um, autologous stem cell transplant used to be, um, or still is, excuse me, uh, but uh, is, is less relevant, I would say, for, um, for lymphomas nowadays. Uh, but it is still an important treatment strategy for many patients. Essentially, um, the treatment is you're using high-intensity chemotherapy uh, to try to eradicate residual disease. And the major side effect of that chemotherapy is it kills off all your stem cells. Um, and I told you that stem cells can self-replicate over and over and over again, but not if you give it high-intensity chemotherapy. Uh, so in order to give a higher-intensity chemotherapy regimen, you first have to, have to collect your stem cells before that treatment. And then you give the treatment, and then you give the stem cells right back. And so the correct term is high-dose chemotherapy followed by stem cell rescue. Well, the question is, is what if you don't respond to chemotherapy to begin with? Um, would that be a strategy that you'd want to employ? And what if you had recurrence after your stem cell transplant? And I'm going to pause on answering those questions, because we will. 
Uh, now there's another treatment uh, is allogeneic stem cell transplant. That's using someone else's stem cells instead of your own. And um, the way what you're doing in that situation is you're first eradicating the immune system with what we call conditioning therapy. And depend, depending on the intensity of the conditioning, uh, there is some added anti-cancer benefits to that. And then we infuse donor stem cells into the recipient or the patient. Uh, the side effects are uh, pretty intense. Um, you are giving someone else's immune system to someone else. And uh, because of that, they're um, is um, what's called graft versus host disease. That's what we don't want, but what we do want is something called the graft versus malignancy effect. I'm also known as a graft versus leukemia, graft versus tumor effect. Um, we want the donor's immune system to recognize the cancer is bad. And if you recall, I mentioned that T cells recognize what looks like you and doesn't look like you. If it looks like you as a friend, it doesn't look like you as an enemy. Well, one of the biggest problems is that your own immune system, your own T cells, can't recognize your cancer as bad. So the concept of an allogeneic stem cell transplant is that you're giving someone else's immune system that grows up into a new immune system that perhaps can recognize the cancer as bad. And the source of that, the graft versus malignancy effect, are T cells. So who gets CAR T cell therapy? Uh, so I have it kind of highlighted there uh, because um, there are other approved indications for CAR T cell therapy, and probably next year there's going to be more, which is good. <laughs> um, but um, but I'm going to focus really on the uh, lymphomas. Uh, essentially, diffuse large B cell lymphoma and other aggressive B cell lymphomas that aren't responding to the first line of therapy or a relapse of diseases in the first line of within the first year of receiving that first line therapy. Um, also approved is uh, those with diffuse large B cell lymphoma that are refractory to two or more lines of therapy, follicular lymphoma after several lines of therapy, and then mantle cell lymphoma after several lines of therapy. <clears throat> so there are four cell therapies that are approved, excuse me, that are approved uh, by the FDA. Uh, the first one is uh, Axacel, or I guess Carta. The second one is Tisacel, or Chimera. Third one is Lisacel, or Brianzi. And the fourth one is Brexucel, or Sicardis. And um, some of them can be used for, for several different malignancies. Others, such as Sicardis, can help. It's only approved for mantle cell lymphoma. But actually, it's also approved for ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. However, things do change, and they're under investigation for other diseases as well. So why would you get CAR T cell therapy? Well, if you recall, what if you didn't respond to chemotherapy to begin with? Um, and if you recall, I talked about autologous stem cell transplant, where the concept is chemotherapy, to try to eradicate the disease so it never comes back again. Well, if you're not responding to chemotherapy, why would you do that approach, right? It doesn't really make too much sense. And, and inherently, the disease might have acquired additional mutations where it just does not respond well to the chemotherapeutic approaches that we have. Or what if you had a recurrence after your auto transplant? And then also recall, I don't think I said this, but I might have put it in the slide, is that an allo stem cell transplant, the mortality is pretty high. Um, and that is um, primarily because of that graft versus host disease where the donor's immune system can recognize other aspects of your body as bad, not the cancer. Uh, and then also infection, and also sometimes relapse of the disease itself. Uh, but um, we don't really want to jump to an allogeneic stem cell transplant if we don't have to. So we also know that in aggressive lymphomas like diffuse large B cell lymphoma, an autologous stem cell transplant is not as effective as CAR T cell therapy when the cancer has returned within 12 months of their first line of therapy. And to kind of break that down, is um, for those on the call, um, there might be people who have been diagnosed with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. The standard treatment up until fairly recently is RCHOP or R epoch. And um, and um, if you had that response and the disease came back within 12 months, what we used to do is take patients to um, a stem cell transplant, an autologous stem cell transplant. 
But uh, two major studies uh, recently reported out, when I say recently, I mean in the past two to three years, that compared head-to-head -head, um, CAR T cell therapy or stem cell transplant. And it appeared that the patients who received CAR T cell therapy within 12 months of recurrence of their disease um, had better outcomes, meaning longer-term disease-free survival. So that's now why we're doing CAR T cell therapy earlier on in patients' uh, treatment plan. And then for follicular lymphoma, that is typically considered a more indolent, slow-growing lymphoma. And for most patients with that diagnosis, um, you oftentimes do treatment, and you don't have to need you don't have to do a treatment for another three to four to even 10 years because the disease is very slow growing and not causing any, any problems. However, there is a very small subset, actually about 20% of, of patients with follicular lymphoma, that the disease is actually more active. And um, those patients, their diseases don't respond to the therapies as well. And oftentimes we're, moving, we're having to do treatment after treatment after treatment, and the, the benefit is, is diminishing over time. And those are the patients with follicular lymphoma where CAR T cell therapy uh, would be beneficial. And then for mantle cell lymphoma, oftentimes the treatments just become less effective or they don't last as long. And those are the patients where um, there's an indication for CAR T cell therapy. So what's the goal? Uh, cure. <laughs> that would be great. If we can cure you of your malignancy, uh, that is wonderful. Uh, the success rate does vary based upon the disease as well as your prior therapies. Uh, but there are some signals that can tell us those that have a higher likelihood of longer-term disease-free survival um, is if you've had less disease before CAR T cell therapy. So basically what that means is if, if um, you had some response to something before you received CAR T cell th therapy, it kind of tells us that your disease is more sensitive to treatments. Um, so the less disease burden that you have going into CAR T cell therapy is less work that the T cells have to do. And therefore, they're more effective at what they do. And if you have a complete response, which is, a, is, a, is, a, is actually a terminology that we use, um, it, it, by PET scan at day 30, that does predict longer-term disease-free survival. And then, most importantly, if you have not had a recurrence of your disease by two years after CAR T infusion, there's a very low likelihood it will come back. So what's the plan? Uh, so the T cells, as I've kind of alluded to, um, your T cells can't recognize your cancer as bad. And the reason of that is because your disease is of you, and the T cells are of you as well, and so it thinks it's a friend and doesn't want to kill it. So why don't we re-engineer your T cells so they can do what they need to do, which is kill the cancer? And what CAR stands for is chimeric antigen receptor. Uh, essentially what, and I kind of go over the steps in a little bit, but um, essentially we're re-engineering the T cells to recognize your cancer. At that present state for all approved products for lymphomas, the target is something called CD19. And that's a marker on, on nearly all mature B cells. And, and nearly all malignancies um, that are lymphomas express that. And, um, and so essentially that, what that is is a, is a protein on the outside of, of the B cell. So the current steps, uh, this is kind of just the reality, <laughs> the current steps uh, for uh, CAR T cell therapy is, first step is getting approval and um, getting the production lined up. Uh, step two is the T cell collection, and then waiting for that growth. And that growth period can last 14 to 42 days. Step three is receiving low-dose chemotherapy for several days. And I'll explain why in a little bit. Step four is CAR T cell infusion, and step five is monitoring for the side effects and toxicities. So what is the process? Um, so the first step is is removing your T cells. and um, what will happen is that you would get connected to a machine that's about like a dialysis machine where it takes out what we want, which are just your T cells, and puts everything back inside of you in rapid fire. And that process takes several hours, um, very few side effects. And, um, and then those T cells are sent to where they need to go, whether that's in town, whether that's in 
um, your um, institution or whether that's uh, sent away um, uh, for the pharmaceutical processing. And um, their T cells are selected for step two. They're activated and they're enriched. Um, essentially, um, you have to pick out the right T cells to grow and expand because not all T cells are the same. And then what we call a viral vector is used to transfer DNA to tell those T cells to grow those new receptors. And these viruses are what we call like an, an inert, like they're not going to cause sickness. Um, they're kind of just used as a vehicle to get those that DNA to the right place. Then those T cells are expanded, and then they're shipped back to you, or to the program. And then after that lymphodepleting therapy, they're infused into you. Process, and I, I told you about how you, the cells are taken out, it's sent away. That can take up, you know, two to six weeks, depending upon uh, the manufacturing processes and the issues that could happen with that. Um, in the meantime, you might need disease control. You know, many diseases are very active and aggressive, and therefore they can't just wait around um, for, for this treatment to start. Um, so many times we have to advise bridging therapy, and that is to, to maintain that disease control until CAR T cell therapy uh, can occur. And then approximately four to seven days prior to the CAR T cell infusion, low-dose chemotherapy is needed, and we call that lymphodepleting chemotherapy. You can kind of allude to what we're talking about by just the name of that, but essentially we need to give some low-dose chemotherapy to just knock down that immune system in order to accept your CAR T cells back into you. And the reason for that is that these cells are of you, but they don't look entirely like you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I'm getting a message that perhaps you can't hear me. I will keep talking until <laughs> um, someone says that there's a problem. Uh, so the T cells, um, are then infused into you after that lymphodepleting therapy. Day zero through 30. So the, the cells can be administered either in the inpatient or the outpatient setting. And um, that depends on the program. It depends on uh, many different aspects of things, to be honest with you. Um, the current standard, I would say, across the country and maybe world is to do this in the inpatient setting. Uh, many programs are moving forward to treating in the outpatient setting, such as our institution, uh, for many different reasons. Uh, but essentially, the most important thing is that we're closely monitoring you for the side effects and toxicities that occur right after that infusion and roughly through day 30. And those three major side effects are infection, cytokine release syndrome, and neurotoxicity. And thus, um, just as an important point, if you are not in the hospital, you will need to stay close to the treatment center because of this unique therapy that we're giving. If you have an issue and you go to a local hospital that has no idea what CAR T cell therapy is, that could be dangerous and risky. So there's many kind of um, things in play, I guess you could say, that to ensure that um, if it's in the outpatient setting that um, there is a safe um, a plan of action for you. So for the, the major side effects, um, so I'm going to go into the three ones that I just brought up, infection, cytokine release syndrome, and neurotoxicity. Um, these can occur within the first 30 days. Um, so for the first one is infection. It's caused primarily by that lymphodepleting chemotherapy. And um, the risk is the uh, is bacterial and fungal infections, and that's typically during a period of neutropenia when those neutrophil counts are low due to the chemotherapy. That's roughly day zero through 10, maybe even up to day 14. To reduce the risk of infection, you will be on an antiviral, an antibiotic, and an antifungal. But if you get a fever, it might not be from infection. It might actually be from cytokine release syndrome. So the way I explain it to patients is that um, 
imagine what happens to your body when you get sick. Don't imagine. I mean, it happens. You get sick. <laughs> um, when you get sick, the very common thing you get is a fever. Sometimes if you get very sick, um, sepsis perhaps, um, which we hope you don't ever get, but if you do, um, that's associated with low blood pressure. And another aspect of infection um, can be uh, shortness of breath. Uh, we call a capillary leak of the lungs, hypoxia. And all of that, all those things, fever, low blood pressure, and shortness of breath are all caused by T cells. And T cells, when they are trying to fight an infection, they release natural chemicals called cytokines that basically corral the troops and say, we need to fight a fight. We need to fight an infection. And let's grow and reproduce to do that together. And um, so these natural cytokines, um, these natural chemicals, are the communication tools for your immune system. So what happens when you get the CAR T cells infused? Well, they start to grow and replicate to do what they were designed to do, which is to fight the cancer. And in that process, they can release those natural chemicals, those cytokines, and mimic um, critical illness. And the first signal is fever. And ideally that you don't get low blood pressure or shortness of breath, but those are things that are watched for very closely, inpatient or outpatient, wherever you are. And classically, it's within the first roughly five days of, of your treatment. Now, those who have a higher tumor burden prior to CAR T cell therapy do have an increased risk of cytokine release syndrome. And the risk also depends upon what cell product is being used for, for several different reasons. So will you get it? It depends, uh, but you likely will. <laughs> and that, the reason I say that is like, you know, expect the expected and be pleasantly surprised when it doesn't happen. Um, so depending upon your disease, depending on the cell product, there's a very wide variability. And, um, what you will get and what the severity of that cytokine release syndrome gets to. Um, grade one is just a fever. Grade two, fever with lower blood pressure or low oxygen saturation. And then grade three or four is needing supportive medications to, to get that blood pressure up, to keep that blood pressure up, or even um, advanced uh, breathing support, uh, perhaps ventilator support to ensure that you're getting the oxygen that your body needs. So it tends to begin um, on days three to five, and it tends to last for about five to 10 days. Uh, but there's wide variability on when it presents and how severe it is and how long it lasts. Um, there is a treatment. Um, it's, a, it's a blocking agent for those cytokines. It um, has not shown to be effective in the preemptive setting, like giving it as a prevention dose. So you do have to use it at the time that you get the symptoms. And steroids do kind of blunt the immune system response too. This is entirely reversible. However, there can be some secondary effects. Um, basically, like let's suppose that your blood pressure drops, well, that could cause some kidney injury. Um, or if you need steroids, that can increase the risk of infections. And then if you're needing steroids or you're in the hospital because of you know, lower blood pressure or illness, you can become deconditioned. But for the vast majority of patients, it's treatable and reversible with no long-term uh, side effects. So the third major side effect is neurotoxicity. We call that ICANS, which is immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity syndrome, or just neurotoxicity. Uh, so neurotoxicity is driven by the, by the same process as CAR T cells. I'm sorry, as, as cytokine release syndrome. And um, those cytokines can cross the blood-brain barrier and, and lead to many, many different side effects uh, of the central nervous system. And um, the way I describe it to patients is that the neurotoxicity does not cause your, your wires to be cut. <laughs> it causes your wires to be jumbled. Uh, the brain is full of neurons. They communicate with each other um, through, the, through their tentacles, I guess you could say. Um, and it's like a, a, the most complex electrical system on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it can get um, injured, but is completely reversible. And um, side effects can be anything from tremors to forgetfulness, difficulty with comprehension. Um, severe side effect um, could be seizures. Um, you will get frequent and standardized assessments to monitor for any changes. 
um, and that's pretty standardized across the um, across the realm. You, you would probably be getting the same questions and answers and, and, and evaluations um, to monitor objectively for any changes before that might be clinically um, identified. Um, so I say, well, you get it. It depends. Um, there's wide variability and wide variability on that severity. And, um, and depending upon your disease state, there are some, um, so for, for example, mantle cell lymphoma, there is a higher incidence of neurotoxicity compared to follicular lymphoma, which is a little bit less. So what are the other toxicities? Well, um, one of the biggest issues and one of the reasons why sometimes there's, there could be an unnecessary delay in getting this treatment for, for patients and, and is the financial toxicity. Um, the cost of the therapy um, just for the for the CAR T cell um, product, uh, essentially that that the, these these T cells are yours, but the but the process of the, how it was made um, is a controlled um, process. And um, right now, the ones that are approved by the FDA are all um, are, are pharmaceutical products, and uh, it's just like all pharma. Industry, <laughs> um, the, you know, the, there is not really a standardized cost of, of these products, um, and so that's very expensive, you know, and, and that takes some time sometimes for insurance companies to ensure that the you know the right patient is getting this you know approved indication. Um, the cost of the supportive care, um, I, I told you about how the blood pressure could be an issue, that sort of type of thing. You could be in the hospital for quite some time. You might need ICU-level care, and that could add um, expenses. Um, less of an issue depending upon certain insurances, um, more of an issue sometimes for the um, government-funded insurance uh, plans, primarily because um, it has, they, they haven't caught up, I guess, which you, they haven't really caught up with um, this treatment. and and. Um, but they're getting there. It's, it's less of an issue now than it was five years ago. So intermediate term side effects. Um, so there's this brain fog that's roughly for the first two months, um, but safely you could say it's, a, it's for the first three months. Definitely underreported, um, but it's actually now being discussed. And uh, the re there was a recent um, article that was presented about this. Um, but, I, but I've told patients this for years is that um, it does affect your concentration and, and short-term memory. And getting back to work after day 30 could be difficult for a period of time. Um, but it does resolve, and it's a shorter-term issue. However, most programs advise not to drive for the first two months after the, after the therapy. And, um, and the reason for that is a shift. You might have some issues with um, your, um, your reflexes being able to kind of respond to to risks <laughs> on the road. Um, other late effects are lower blood counts. So uh, there is real-world data that says that about 30% of patients have prolonged lower blood counts. Initial studies, it was more like 10% of patients. Um, it's actually closer to about a third of patients have lower blood counts for an intermediate period of time. And it could be because the CAR T cells are sticking around throwing off those natural chemicals and maybe suppressing the natural um, hematopoiesis, the natural blood production system. It does resolve over time, though. It is not long-term. And somewhat related to that is there could be a prolonged infection risk. Um, could be because those neutrophils are, are delayed in, in returning. Um, but it's actually, a lot of it has to do with uh, the CAR T cells and its target. So I told you that CD19 is the target for uh, the lymphoma. Well, CD19 is actually on healthy B cells. And those B cells are the ones that have that memory, the strategy, the understanding of what you've seen in the past and what, you're, um, what you are, are protected against. So the T cells might have kind of an a, um, off-target killing effect on your memory B cells and how that shows up. Um, is an increased risk of viral infections. And so there are certain recommendations to reduce the risk of infection. Um, so we want to definitely reduce the risk of shingles. Um, it's, many of us have been exposed to uh, chickenpox as a child. 
uh, and um, fat basically integrates into your DNA and can pop out and cause a problem when your immune system is weaker. And so do want to reduce the risk of that. Um, so you would be on antiviral through at least 12 months post CAR T cell therapy. Um, there is a rare but um, realistic uh, risk of a certain type of lung infection called pneumocystis gerovecchiae. And uh, because of that, you're going to be on antibiotics for um, an advice to at least 12 months post CAR T cell therapy. Some programs might have different recommendations on length of time uh, for these agents, but in general, it's, it's pretty well standardized. Um, now, somewhat related to those B cells being targeted, um, the ones that have that memory and understanding of your immune system, is something called hypogammaglobinemia. Um, your, the B cells grow into other cells called plasma cells that make natural antibodies to things. And if you don't have as many B cells to turn into the plasma cells that make the natural antibodies, you might not have enough natural antibodies to fight infection. And so around day 90 after CAR T cell therapy, I advise that we, we check an IgG level. And if it's low, um, we tend to advise um, giving you those natural antibodies monthly until so your immune system is, is strong enough on its own. And in some patients who have a prolonged low neutrophil count, which can occur, um, typically a, a shot called GCSF uh, or natural growth factor um, does help. Um, COVID revaccination is advised at, um, around, actually around day 90. It says day 30 here, but I think I messed that up. <laughs> Um, and I also advise um, influenza vaccine at, at day 90 as well. Now, um, what we're less clear on is if um, you need to be revaccinated for anything else. Um, uh, it kind of goes hand in hand with what I already discussed, is that um, you know those B cells, those healthy B cells, the, one that, the ones that have that natural memory and strategy and understanding, they might be affected. And we don't know if that has long-term um, weakening of that immune system. So um, there are some programs that are advising revaccination of all your childhood uh, immunizations. Uh, it's a little bit too early to say that that's a, a national standard. Um, and even our program has not um, advised that just yet. However, if you do get revaccinated, you don't want to do that at day 30. Mm -hmm. It's actually, you want to give it at least three months afterwards because that immune system is so compromised. And so that memory formation might not occur if you do it too soon after your treatment. There are some other late effects. Um, second malignancies is a, is a real identification. Uh, there are an increased risk of skin cancers and also an increased risk of another type of hematologic malignancy called myelodysplastic syndrome or MDS. And a lot of times this can be associated with needing multiple prior therapies in the past. Um, so it might not be just directly related to CAR T cell therapy. And there are some rare reports of neurologic toxicities that don't resolve. Uh, and um, it's a little bit less uh, concerning, I would say, because it's, it's, the, the data is a little bit murky on this. Um, now, there are CAR T cell therapy is being used for other diseases, such as multiple myeloma. And um, there are some additional neurotoxicities that are a little bit longer term for them that can develop. But we haven't seen that with lymphoma CAR T cell therapy. The quality of life. Uh, so there will be a short-term impact on your quality of life um, with this treatment. Um, you're going to be hospitalized and or you're going to come into clinic on a daily basis, and you're going to need to have a caregiver with you 24-7 that's going to know your therapy and, and kind of be your um, support uh, for, for everything. Um, you're going to need blood and platelet transfusions. You might need that. You might have infections or the need for infection risk reduction by maybe IVIG infusions on a monthly basis, and then those toxicities. Um, so for the short term, yes, it does. Um, affect your quality of life. But the way I always describe it is that, you know, well, this is a short-term sacrifice for the long-term gain. And it's a one-time treatment, and ideally it does what we want it to do, which is cure you of your malignancy. However, um, there, you know, it, 
it uh, it does have those side effects and and um, you know, hopefully it does what we want it to do. Um, there, are the intermediate and longer term effects on your quality of life is probably mainly the infection and infection risks. Um, there's also the psychosocial aspects of things of, you know, is, is my disease going to come back or not? And, and then maybe in some patients there could be some neurologic longer term side effects, not necessarily for lymphoma patients though. So I uh, don't want to talk about that too much more. Uh, so how can we decrease the side effects, you know, all the things that affect your quality of life or all the things that I just talked about on the cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity? Well, we are doing certain things. Um, one is we're giving prevention steroids on day zero through two for certain um, cell products. And it's shown to reduce the severity of the cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity. Um, there's many clinical trials that we're looking at how do we reduce the toxicity. And... Um, and to, to, our program is pretty robust with outpatient CAR T cell therapy. And, and the reason for that is that if you're going to develop the side effects of, of DRS and neurotoxicity, well, we can't entirely predict when that's going to occur. Well, but does that mean that you have to be in the hospital, you know, indefinitely waiting for that to occur? Um, and so we have remote patient monitoring um, to to identify the signals that we can look at to see uh, when that when that risk occurs. And so I guess that's program specific on decreasing the side effects uh, for that one. And so where we're we going to in the future, where is where are we driving next? I'm trying to play on that car <laughs> car T cell therapy. Uh, so. Um, other lymphocytic disorders, we're definitely investigating if CAR T cell therapy works. I think the most exciting aspect of it in the field of hematology, oncology, are the solid tumors, the, the non-blood cancers. Um, glioblastoma, for example, a, a deadly brain cancer, um, it has some exciting data and exciting outcomes with using CAR T cell therapy. Hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer, prostate cancer. We're investigating all of these. Where we have some ways to go are in the leukemias, in the, um, or, sorry, the myeloid leukemias or the myelodysplastic syndromes. Um, other solid tumors that maybe don't, maybe don't have a good marker that we can educate a, a T cell to target. Um, that's where we're kind of falling behind. So in the future, um, if you haven't received CAR T cell therapy yet, um, hopefully you don't <laughs> have to, uh, but um, but we're looking at many different ways on on, on this kind of the same concept of, of how can you re-educate that immune system, how can you manipulate that immune system, um, your own immune system to, to fight the fight. Um, so one way is by um, instead of having to wait around several weeks for those CAR T cells to grow and expand in the um, outside of your body, could we do that within your body? And um, that's um, something that's actively under investigation right now. Um, using those natural killer cells that I brought up very early on, um, it has some inherent um, anti-cancer uh, benefit, and it does seem to have significantly less incidences of cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity. And it's because of the mechanism of action, how it works. It doesn't need those cytokines to grow and expand and, and fight its fight. Um, another type of cell that we're looking at is monocytes, um, another aspect of your immune system. Um, we're looking at different targets. So instead of just CD19, we're looking at CD20, we're looking at CD22, CD79, many different targets. Um, we're also looking at off-the-shelf, having someone else's T cells already ready to go to fight your fight. And then also genetically re-engineering um, those T cells but remove the drivers of those toxicities. You know, do we need, do those cytokines really need to expand so abruptly or, and so aggressively? Um, perhaps you can still get the job done without as much of the cytokine um, toxicity. And uh, so um, solid tumors, I said, is very exciting uh, for CAR T cell therapy. There is a little bit of um, things that need to uh, be addressed. There are some things that need to be addressed before we get too excited about that, um, but um, but that is in the future. 
Um, there are some off-target effects, for example, um, that, that can occur uh, in those diseases that are being investigated. Um, and uh, um, one of the biggest issues with uh, uh, pretty much all, whether it's solid tumors or, or uh, blood cancers, is how do you um, penetrate what we call the tumor microenvironment. Uh, the tumor um, has found ways to evade the immune system to begin with, and how do those T cells punch in there to, to, to knock down the disease? And the solid tumors, um, when I say solid, it's basically non-blood non cancers, uh, uh, are, are different compared to lymphomas. So I have a lot of ways to go, but uh, the future is extremely bright. <laughs> um, so that's it. Uh, thank you very much. And now, I guess we have some questions. Thank you, Dr. Tease, for this excellent presentation. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you have a question for Dr. Tease, please use the chat box on the left side of the screen to submit your questions. We will answer as many questions as possible. Our first question is actually for someone who is day plus 10. Um, status post his outpatient CAR T, and he wants to know: Is there any way to determine CAR T cell count post therapy to know how long they will reside in the body? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, it is extremely difficult to uh, to count the, the T cells, and the reason for it is because they're still of you. Um, they still actually look like you. Um, the only way that we can do that is by DNA analysis, by looking at snippets of the DNA fragments that were actually uh, used to um, educate the, the, the CAR T cells. Um, so uh, it's not very easily done. And, um, and it's part of the reason why um, it, we have difficulty understanding, actually, um, if the CAR T cells persist or if they don't expand. Um, the, the, it's, it's part of clinical trials, but for those that are getting what we call standard of care, um, we don't have really good, um, we don't have good tests to really uh, look at um, to say like, okay, are, are the T cells expanding the way we want them to, or um, is it going to do what we want it to do? The best, the best test is that day 30 PET scan. Now there's a lot of patients, I mean, the, those who have like, what we call like bulky disease, disease that you know, on, on examination, you feel it on their arms or in their neck, um, and you get the treatment and it shrinks down, you, you already know that it's doing what it needs to do. Um, but the answer is, the question always is, is like, if it's doing what, it, what we want it to do, will it last? And, and really time, and that, that original day 30 PET scan is, is very predictive of, of that long-term benefit. Thank you. There are some questions um, that are more heavily related to insurance, and I will not be covering these since Dr. Tease is not an insurance expert, and we certainly wouldn't want to put him in that position. So for those of you who have asked those questions, we will not be going down that path. Um, the next question, though, um, that we will be covering is, what are the chances for reoccurrence or new cancers following CAR T cell therapy, and how survivable are they? Yeah, so good, another good question. Um, so I, I'll be honest with you. I have I have not seen meaningful um, second cancers. Uh, what I report on that slide is is kind of what's what the book says. Um, what has what, has, what was seen on initial clinical trials, and and the issue is with that is that patients who have received multiple lines of treatment will have an increased risk of other cancers. And it's because of the injury that that chemotherapy, that the medicines that we have do to, to healthy cells. So, um, and this is one of the, why there could be a more value of, of doing a more definitive therapy like CAR T cell therapy, a cell-based therapy earlier on in, in patient's um, journey. Hopefully they don't ever have to need it because they've responded initially and the disease never comes back. But on those who, who do need therapy, using CAR T cell earlier on, instead of having to do multiple lines of treatment, perhaps that actually does decrease the risk of other second um, malignancies in the future. However, the more 
common ones that we do see for those who have received multiple lines of therapy tends to be uh, skin cancers. And very relevant in, in Colorado because we're, we're a mile high and closer to the sun. <laughs> um, but, um, but I strongly advocate all patients, you know, see their dermatologist on a regular basis to, to monitor for any skin changes and, and remove the, the malignant lesions um, before they become more serious. Um, but that, that's primarily the, the big one is, are, are the skin cancers. Um, now, there is, um, I, I did show on that slide, um, a myelodysplastic syndrome, MDS. Um, that is, across the board, if you look at um, almost all of our treatments, that, that comes up a lot um, as, a, as, a, as a slight increased risk uh, compared to, to the standard patient population. Um, that's not anything that we can do anything about or anything that we can uh, have, you know, it's not advised to do frequent lab checks if you're looking for any changes like that. Um, it's, it's simply um, having an ongoing relationship with your hematologist or oncologist and, and having that dialogue and when those concerns come up. Do you have any recommendations on how to treat hyper skin sensitivity? Any fabric that brushes against my skin, especially my legs, feel very prickly. My CAR T was done May 2019. The side effect presented itself in August of 2019. Huh. Well, I, that's that's um, unique, I would say, uh, and I'm not familiar. I have not seen that uh, before. Um, and one of the first questions I have is: Is are there other are there other sensitivity um, issues on the, on the deeper aspect of things? Like, are you having um, what we call proprioceptive issues where you might not know where your feet are? Um, and, and, and I'm wondering if this is a form of like neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy. Um, I'm also curious on if this is a, from a nutritional deficiency, like B12 deficiency. So, um, my, my first, I, I, I I, I can't answer that, to be honest with you, because I'm not familiar with exactly how how this is playing out for you, so I apologize. Uh, but that sounds um, frustrating. I'm sorry. There could be some medications, you, maybe they've already been tried, such as gabapentin, that, that could perhaps help with uh, the nerves. But, um, but that's unique even in and of itself. And hopefully they would reach out to their provider um, that gave them the CAR T cell therapy yeah. um, for some support. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if, if, thank you. Yeah, if if, um, if your current hematologist is not the one that did your treatment, um, and I would also say, yeah, reach out to the hematologist that did your CAR T cell therapy and see if um, this has been something that they've identified. I, I, I'm a little bit puzzled by that. I'm, I'm sorry. The next question um, is asking for some guidance around some prophylaxis, vaccine boosters, pediatric immunizations, and titers. They are permanently immunocompromised from CAR T cell therapy, including leukocyte subsets and IgG since 2021. This person's been taking oral prophylaxis, both acyclovir and Bactrim, and boosters for influenza and COVID-19. This approach assumes a minimal vaccine response is better than none. However, pediatric revaccination and titers aren't available to me. Can you clarify the guidance for post-cellular vaccination? Yeah, well, there there isn't. That's the thing is that there is not a there's not a national standard on ad advising whether or not patients should be revaccinated. Um, it sounds like what I'm hearing though is that um, this. This person has had um, their titers looked at and checked to see if they are responding to vaccinations. That that would be the ideal state for all patients. If we could check titers to know if someone needed a uh, revaccination, that that would be great. However, what um, we stop doing for our, our stem cell transplant patients is actually getting titers to identify whether or not uh, patients needed. Um, uh, revaccinations for things, and one of the reasons for that was, well, are those titers actually truly detecting 
um, the strength of that immune system. And if you have those titers, does that mean that that, like, there, there could be value of re-educating the immune system, essentially, with vaccination, um, whether or not you have titers or don't have titers, definitely if you don't have titers. Um, and so um, what I would say is, is that uh, sounds like that person is doing the right things by, by getting you vaccinated, but it is a possibility, yes, that your immune system is has been, you know, permanently injured um, by the treatments, by the CAR T cell therapy, perhaps, um, that do that does increase your risk of, of infection. Now that being said, uh, even though there's, you know, the, the past couple of years have been really different, <laughs> um, you know, and, and there's politicalization of of lots of things that we wouldn't have thought in the past. Uh, it, despite that, the herd immunity becomes your best friend. Uh, and the herd immunity is what actually protects most of us. And um, it's important to, to also know that even those who get the annual influenza vaccine, only 60 to 70% of them actually respond to that. Yet, the, if, if no one got it, we'd have much, much, much more cases of influenza that is deadly. Um, and it's kind of the same concept for, for all, um, you know, all vaccinations is that, um, yes, it is, it is accepted that not everyone will, will respond to them, uh, but the more that we have that, that get it, the more that actually um, have that protection, it actually helps those who don't have that protection. So at the end of the day, I think all things considered, you're doing the right thing by getting revaccinated. It could be giving you some, some sense, some snippet of, of protection, uh, but uh, those around you are also giving you that protection. So, um, so yeah, that's what I would say to that. Terrific. How many months should a CAR T survivor wait before getting back on a my uh, sorry? A bicycle or a mountain bike or roller blade. <laughs> um, so I think it's person specific. Um, so I told I, I had one slide in there that said um, that some patients have prolonged cytopenias or prolonged lower blood counts um, for a couple of months after CAR T cell therapy. That's not the case for all, uh, but for some you could still have a low platelet count, um, and that could be risky if you're doing more um, activities that, that could be higher risk for, for bleeding, for example, or injuring your skull. <laughs> um, so um, my assumption is, is that you probably are aware of what your most recent counts are. Um, I would also say that th there is that good two months of that brain fog um, that uh, you might not be able to react as quickly um, to to things um, if you're mountain biking, for example. Um, so I would give it at least at least two months after CAR T cell therapy before jumping on the bike. And especially if your counts if your counts aren't robust, then you need to wait till the counts are better. Good advice. Is there anything I can do in remission um, after I receive CAR T cell therapy? Yeah, well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we, there's no evidence right now that anyone benefits from a maintenance therapy or anything um, that could, uh, you know, d taking a, a medicine to um, reduce the risk of recurrence, that type of thing. Um, I do tell patients this, though, that um, you know, keeping your body um, active, keeping um, your muscles strong, eating well and healthy, uh, that does have overall benefits to your health uh, and um, that strengthens your immune system in different ways. Another thing I tell patients, and this is, um, you know, based upon a ton of data, is vitamin D supplementation. Um, pretty much every single patient with lymphoma should be on vitamin D. Uh, and um, I'm not going to make specific recommendations because those who, whose kidneys, for example, maybe don't function as, as well as maybe they used to might need a lower dose of vitamin D, uh, but it's available over the counter um, in roughly 2,000 international units daily should 
suffice for even patients with a, um, with kidney dysfunction. So, um, uh, physical activity and vitamin D. <laughs> Those are the big ones. Dr. Teese, can you comment on the response rate with Chimera for diffuse large cell B cell lymphoma during clinical trials versus after approval? And what is the current data on effectiveness? How does Chimera, sorry, how does Chimera compare to Yescarta and Brianzi? Oh, good. So, um, yeah, and let me just finish off. I, I didn't really kind of go into that vitamin D. Um, so vitamin D actually um, promotes a, a, a stronger immune system, and the theory is, is that that immune system then um, reduces the risk of recurrence. So that's why vitamin D supplementation is shown to, um, has been associated with those with better outcomes. But I just want to finish off that one. So chimera um, is approved for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, um, and there are three products for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, chimera, um, Yascarda, and Branzi. And um, at, at the end, it, just to say this right now, you cannot compare them because they've never been compared. They never were on a clinical trial where, you know, patients are randomized to one versus the other versus the other. And and because of that, um, it's extremely hard to say one is better or worse than another. Um, but generally speaking, um, the inclusion criteria for all the studies were somewhat similar, um, somewhat similar. Um, the the Chimera, Branzi, and Yescarda. Um, for Branzi and Chimera, it's the the mechanism of the CAR T cells are a little bit different than Yescarda, and um, but that's not the whole story on on slight differences in outcomes and responses. And I'm and I'm really trying to be vague here, <laughs> um, because if you look at the initial studies, um, and uh, there's there's an extremely wide variability in those responses. Um, basically anywhere between 40 to 60 percent response rates. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it's it's more about um, the patients that have a sustained response. And in general, across the board for all those the cell products, that, that's roughly the same. And it's roughly, for, for diffuse RGB cell lymphoma, roughly 40 percent of patients have a long-term disease-free survival, 40 to 50 percent. Um, and and that is, is not very that doesn't vary too much between all those cell products. And but it, but it's again it's important um, and it's a huge caveat is that you cannot compare them because they never really were really were compared head to head. Um, but that being said, um, depending upon who your cell therapy specialist is, they're probably going to have preferences on which ones and why. Um, because they are a little bit different, each one, whether it's a toxicity profile, um, whether or not they're safer to be administered in one place versus another, or perhaps um, some other data that, that can be used to determine um, what's best for you. Is there a marker for residual and replicated CAR T cells? Is there a mark? So, um, no, there's not. <laughs> uh, just to, to kind of simplify that, um, not that's readily available for for um, a clinician to get. Um, it get, kind of goes back to like having to you know the snippet of of those T cells that's different from your your T cells that aren't CAR T cells, and trying to compare them to see if they're present. Um, there is not a good marker, essentially, to know if the T cells are persistent or not. Yeah. What CAR T cell therapies are available for mantle cell lymphoma? Yeah. So the only one that's approved right now is Brexucel or Tacardis, uh, and that is um, for patients who have had two or more lines of therapy, uh, and um, which one of them includes uh, Brutinib or a BTK inhibitor. Uh, so that's the only one that's available right now. Such great questions. It's not the, it's, um, yeah. I was going to say for the mantle cell lymphoma question, um, 
not all patients with anthocyanosis lymphoma that might be the indication to get. So it's really patient specific on whether or not um, there's an indication for CAR T cell therapy. Super. Such great questions. On behalf of the BMT InfoNet and our partners, I'd like to thank Dr. Keith for his very helpful presentation and thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions. Please contact BMT InfoNet if we can help you in any way. Please enjoy the rest of the symposium.